Welcome to Redirect, Creation Law Perspectives. I, I think legally, we're not allowed to use the word <laughs> <laughs> Somebody filed a, a complaint. The FDC? Semi-regular immigration law podcast. I'm Stephen Robbins. I'm here with Matthew Archambault. Yep, right here. Fellow immigration attorney in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We actually do a show every week. Right. Those are the we, deep we cuts. Just don't, we just don't release a show every week. All right, you got to go on eBay and find the bootleg shows on vinyl. We figure in like 30 years, as we're like on our deathbeds, we're released like the lost episodes. If I had tapes of all the shows and I died, my family would just throw them straight in the trash. (laughs) It would be it would be one of those situations. We go to like an estate sale and there's you know the family they're trying to get rid of all their grandparents. Yeah. My wife there's like those. photo albums for like a dollar. The, the family just doesn't care. I think about that <laughs> all the time with the stuff that I sort of collect and you know, value. Do you buy those photo albums and try to pass them off as your own family? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will buy. Um, I've bought negatives before to go home and see what this, if there's any interesting. But yeah, all my stuff, my rocks, I collect agates, my plastic model kits, all of that right in the trash. No sentimental value. What is your wife going to throw away immediately when you die? All of it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just all of it. I guess that's what you do when someone dies. Yeah, she's she's not as sentimental as some. She's not a huge fan of you. (laughs) When my mother died, we found drawings from my brother that he did when he was in kindergarten, Uh which meant that he was in kindergarten. We lived in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Then we moved to Liverpool, New York, upstate New York. And then she moved to another home in upstate New York. And she took these little crappy kindergarten drawings, mm-hmm. you know, from one, two, three, three different moves. And I showed them to my brother. I'm like, look, she kept these drawings of yours. Mm-hmm. Do you want them? And he just, he took them right in a garbage bag. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like not even a second thought. Oh, wow. Right in the garbage bag. So. Oh, that's the Archambault family right there, guys. Yeah, yeah. Sentimental. Well, well, we are, you know, we're just sort of shooting the shit because as it turns out, everything is fixed. Yeah. First, yeah, I mean, first of all, Vice President went down and she discovered the root causes of migration. So now she knows. And she'll fix them in those countries. And it's fixed. She's going to end, end corruption in Guatemala mm-hmm. and in all of Central America. And that's key. I think that's a big, that's a big deal. Yeah. Can you imagine? We did a coup down there, and then they had like a major civil war and genocide. Yeah. We sent our vice president down to be like, what's going on down here? Like, what? How, how did this all happen? How did this happen? Why are you guys so corrupt? You know, why? Wow, you guys have a real problem here with your corruption. So we're going to fix it. We can't say it's fixed yet. I mean, but I mean, give it a few weeks. We've been complaining on this show very ungratefully, right? Mm -hmm. About a lack of direction given to the ICE prosecutors in removal proceedings. And we finally got a prosecutorial discretion memo. Yeah. That's the Oprah (laughs) gif. Memo. So that came out. And then actually a friend of the show, Aaron Reichlin Melnick. Right. He uh, Twitter threaded about an hour ago, all these regulatory changes that are coming from the Biden administration. And I will say, non-sarcastically, these look good, right? And actually looking at these regulatory changes, most of them are rolling back Trump things. But it's a good reminder of like, all the stuff the Trump administration had in the hopper, right? All the work permit changes and the death to asylum regulations that were either tied up in lawsuits or that they were working on that are now being rolled back. So that is very, very good. And we're happy to see that. But should we first talk real quick about this little clip that this is obviously making the rounds and we joked about it a minute ago. Let's uh, listen to this real quick. This is Vice President Kamala Harris in Guatemala investigating the root causes, which, by the way, I'm being sarcastic, but it's good that they're having this focus, that they are going down there, that they're talking about 
the push factor, right? We always talk about how people love our freedom. They love our jobs. And so the administration deserves some credit for <laughs> framing it in this way rather than the sort of traditional way. But these are prepared remarks, by the way. <laughs> and I want to emphasize that the goal of our work is to help Guatemalans find hope at home. At the same time, I want to be clear to folks in this region who are thinking about making that dangerous trek to the United States-Mexico border. Do not come. Do not come. The United States will continue to enforce our laws and secure our border. There are legal methods by which migration can and should occur. But we, as one of our priorities, will discourage illegal migration. And I believe if you come to our border, you will be turned back. So let's discourage our friends, our neighbors, our family members from embarking on what is otherwise an extremely dangerous journey, where in large part the only people who benefit are coyotes. And let us do our work together, Mr. President, again, with our mutual commitment of knowing that hope is on the way. She says there's legal ways to come, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about all the incredible ways that a Guatemalan can just come to the United States. The thing I hate about this clip so much is it plays into so much of the bullshit that we have to wade through in the Facebook comments and from the right wing. What she said is exactly what they said during the Trump administration, right? Right. This is not exaggeration or anything. If her comments were given by a Trump official, it could have actually had the same words. She didn't use better words. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I mean, I think this is similar to Hillary had said something similar. So it was, it was the message during the Obama administration. Right. And then when it became the message during the Trump administration, people got really upset about it. I think people like us did hearken back that they're actually giving the same message that Obama did. But we kind of thought the Biden administration was going to be a little different because. Well, the difference is Hillary says we need barriers, but there's not like a frothy mouth. Build those barriers at the. No, but, at the but she also did say, like, don't come here. And don't come. I mean, right. Hillary right. did say that. She had the same. Right raising the same message. The thing with the Obama administration, we thought, okay, they're saying this in a misguided attempt to show the right that they're strong in immigration, therefore to kind of move towards, you know, some type of immigration reform. So like, you know, we're kind of coming over to your side, we're showing good faith. Mm -hmm. And we saw that that didn't work. So with the Biden administration, we figured, well, they understand that tactic doesn't work, yet they're doing the same thing. So, and I, I've said this before, I've kind of moved away from like, that's really their strategy to that's what they actually believe and they right. want. Right. Now, so, yeah, the, the difference, like I was saying, is Hillary can say, don't come, build more barriers. The Democratic base doesn't take that up as a frothy mouthed chant at a rally. But the policy exists in practice. Yeah. Whereas on the right, if you say build that wall, it becomes a rallying cry. But at the end of the day, it motivates the two bases in different ways. And it's not people who are saying they're exactly the same. They're not exactly the same. But in this aspect, there are these major overlaps. Well, I mean, I think that the, the message to people coming from, especially from Central America, coming from not the United States, to our southern border, that message is exactly the same. Right. I right. mean, there really is no difference between what they said under the Trump administration, like, don't come, we're going to turn you back, it's dangerous, you know, and then they, do they call it virtue signaling? Like, mm -hmm. oh, look how dangerous it is, and you're putting your children in danger and women and all that. When They don't really care, right? Right. Like, they right, don't right. care about that and the vice president is saying the same thing. She right. has the exact same message. 
And we kind of talked about it in, you see my Twitter feed, I've talked about all these immigration activists who have gone into the Biden administration and seemingly have done very little that would, what we kind of hoped. And now maybe all these regulations, maybe this is where we're going to see the payoff. Mm -hmm. But when this is a type of, I can't even say it anymore. You know what I want to say, right? Rhetoric? <laughs> Rhetoric. Rhetoric. Matthew, Matthew has a tick. I have like, it's like, I'm like, it's rhetoric, right? And I'm like, wait, maybe that's the way I say it. And it should be rhetoric. So with this type of language coming out of the White House, <laughs> like you wonder like how effective these immigration activists are being with this, because these are right. These are prepared remarks. She's not, it wasn't like she was like running to the helicopter and she right. just did something off, or something. off and where they can yeah. go back and like take it back. So it is discouraging. There's a couple of different things about it that really bother me. Like I was saying earlier, she plays into this notion that people who are coming illegally, they just need to do it the right way. Yeah. There's these other paths and just do it that way. The other thing, telling people it's dangerous, you know, it's like, yeah, you put troops on the border of Guatemala, Mexico by agreement with those countries. But also put, they, they know it's dangerous. Well, I mean, I, I don't. Do you think these people are home going, you know, you know what we should do for a nice week long vacation? We should travel through Mexico on foot right. to the United States and cross over. Wouldn't that be grandly what fun? Do they, what do they call that train that goes through Mexico? The Beast. The Beast, yeah. They think it's just like a Disney ride. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's f***ing insulting, really. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is insulting. And, and like I said, it ignores the fact that the trip is dangerous explicitly by design. The parts of the... Yeah. The border wall are put up at the safest crossing points, literally as a policy choice, knowing that it would drive border crossers to you know, dangerous stretches of desert. And so, you know, don't come. It's dangerous as if you care. You know, if you really cared, you'd make it less dangerous. But the other thing that really is mind boggling to me about this is she doesn't have to go and say, please come seek asylum. It's amazing. We're ready for you. She could just not say this. Like, yeah. Just don't say anything. And the reason for saying it is completely lost on me because you have thousands of Hispanic people, young activists. I think about all the activists in Arizona who dedicated, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours to get them elected who hear this or, or think about your clients who are from Guatemala who've won asylum. They're part of this country, and then they hear that their trip was a mistake, that they shouldn't have come, that somehow it's, you know, illegal or frowned upon, and how that must make them feel. And on the flip side, what potential advantage could this possibly garner you? It's not like Kevin McCarthy saw that and went, oh, wow, you know, the administration is serious. They're not open borders. Look at Kamala. She's using her serious voice. You know, she's got her serious face on. No, like, my congressperson, the very next day, was posting the same nonsense about Kamala Harris hasn't even been to the border, and she's an open borders communist. It didn't win them anything with the right. And the thing is, like, she is the point person, right, on this issue. Right. So did she not study the issue? Did she not see that this was the message during Obama and Trump, and it had no effect on the flow of, I mean... If the purpose was to keep people from coming. Right. That's the other thing. That's the other it's thing. It's never shown that it works. Right. I mean, do you think there's like a family in Guatemala, this indigenous family who like their, being persecuted or maybe not even being persecuted. Maybe they're just starving right. because of climate change. Their home has been ripped apart by the hurricanes. They're starving. Maybe they're being threatened by gangs or narco traffickers are going to be sitting there watching their TV, which they don't have, or listening to their radio, or right. let's say they're listening to like a little transistor radio. I don't know what they have. They're on there. They have a cell phone. They see this video of the vice president and go, wait a minute. Wait, she makes a really good point. Unpack your bags, kids. We Unpack should just stay and we'll, we'll figure out a legal way to do this. And of course, just so everyone who's listening and yelling at their whatever device they are listening to this podcast on, 
Obviously, applying for asylum is a legal way of emigrating to the United States. There's nothing illegal about it. Well, that's we the get other. <laughs> we, get, we get that. So just so you know, we know. It's incredible because it's a one minute clip, but there's so many boners in there. Mm. Uh, I, I shouldn't probably use that word. Probably not. So many uh, boneheaded mistakes <laughs> or not mistakes. She obviously did it on purpose, so you can't really characterize it as a mistake. But yeah, the fact that she's conflating asylum seekers with calling it illegal immigration, that's out of the last four years. And as you're saying, out of the last 12, really, to paint these people as criminals. What you're proposing to do is to take a dangerous journey and then to do something criminal by trying to come into our country. And that's not what the law says. Yeah. And she could have used her platform to clarify that. No, I mean, she could have came and said, hey, look, we understand that there are endemic problems here in Guatemala and all of Central America with corruption, with, you know, within the government and the police. You know, we're committed to working with these governments to try to solve these issues so we can make life better within these countries so not as many people feel like they have to leave to seek safety. And also we're working on having mechanisms that are in these countries so people can you know, make their claims within the country, which I think is a stupid, a stupid program, by the way. But anyways, right. But she could have said all that without saying the don't come, we're going to send you back. She could have yeah. said the whole thing, just kind of leave that part out because it's wrong. It's insulting and it doesn't get you anything. Mitch McConnell's not giving a speech on the Senate floor praising their immigration policies at the border now. Right. She could have said the trip is dangerous. We're working on making it less dangerous. She wouldn't have to add that, but it would be nice. She could have said, our asylum laws are very difficult. They're not easy. But if you come, you will be... You'll be heard. You'll be heard. You'll have a chance to have your case heard. We can't guarantee that you'll win. In fact, many people, if not most, don't win their case. But we will uphold the law and our international obligations. So... And if they didn't want to sound too open borders because they're super concerned about that, she could have also just not done this. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, listen, let's talk about removal proceedings. Yeah. So we have this new memo that came out that has been rumored, right, for quite a while. Right. Yeah. I want to real quick set the table for our non-lawyer friends. Um, okay. If you're an undocumented person, and you're picked up and put in removal proceedings. Now you've got a series of hearings. For certain people, they can get work permits by virtue of having a pending application, right? And sometimes these removal proceedings take a long time. I've got a case coming up, a lady who came in 2013 seeking asylum. She's had a work permit now for seven years, and she works hard and has a good job. And so when the Obama administration started exercising prosecutorial discretion, they were offering up administrative closure which kept the person technically in removal proceedings, but without hearings. So they're off the calendar. The advantage of that is they got to keep their work permit, right? Yeah. They could, they could renew it. And the advantage to the government, if you're a person who's concerned about this sort of thing, is they got to keep tabs on the person. If you ended up arrested or in trouble for something, you could have your proceedings very easily recalendered by motion of the government. So now, tell the folks at home who might have forgotten, maybe they missed season one or they forgot it, <laughs> how you screwed up administrative closure for everyone. Well, so I'm going to take a little issue with the premise of that question. <laughs> you, so, you, you specifically and personally in a way that <laughs> is unique to you. So there was a young man, unaccompanied minor in Philadelphia Immigration Court called Rinaldo Castro Tum, who... The immigration judge administratively closed his case over the objection of the Department of Homeland Security, basically because the immigration judge didn't feel that they had shown enough evidence that he had been properly served with the notice to appear in court. Yeah. And he, did, he did this with Reynaldo, and he did this with maybe about 20 to 30 other cases. So, so the kid doesn't show up for court. He doesn't show up to court. So Reynaldo had come in unlawfully. He entered without inspection. He was in a ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Then he was released to his brother in a town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They sent a hearing notice to that 
address where he purportedly said he was going to go and he never showed up to his court. And this happens a lot. And this happened. There was like 20 or 30 cases like this that Judge Morley in Philadelphia said, you know what? I'm not convinced that you guys followed the proper procedure, closed the case. They appealed it. Because the alternative, when somebody doesn't show up to court, sorry, they get ordered removed. They get ordered removed. And this judge said, well, look, there's a chance that this guy will show up at some point. Yeah. And then we can just get this thing recalendared. But I'm not totally satisfied that you've met the burden of having served him. And the government didn't like that. Right. And they appealed. And the Board of Immigration Appeals issued a decision saying, no, you're wrong. You didn't have the authority to administratively close this case. It's back on. And if he doesn't show up, then you should issue a removal order. So the attorney general at that time, Jeff Sessions, didn't think that was good enough. So he took that case and he he certified it to himself. Mm -hmm. So as an attorney general, they can do that. Then he issued a presidential decision from the attorney general saying, essentially, immigration judges do not have the authority to administratively close cases. Period. Period. Right. <laughs> and that was it. And there were some some carve outs that weren't really relevant to almost anyone there. So that's what killed administrative closure. Now, courts all across the country, federal courts all across the country have been systematically overruling this in the Fourth Circuit, I think the Sixth Circuit, Seventh Circuit, the Third Circuit just issued a decision. That it's in play in the Ninth Circuit. I don't know if you guys had oral arguments yet or something, but some type of decision should be coming down. But I don't think any, I, I mean, maybe one of the listeners can throw us a comment because Stephen won't know. It's true. But I don't think any, any circuit court has upheld Casperton. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't, you're so, right, I don't know. So what has happened over with Trump, Trump put out a memo saying, like, basically, no more prosecutorial discretion. And... The basic posture during all of Trump years from the Department of Homeland Security was F- you. I mean, right. seriously, that was some trial attorneys were a little bit more polite and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. And others would just say F- they would you. say, with all due respect, F- you. <laughs> and others went straight. With F- you. So when Biden became president and we said, hey, you guys have a different attitude. What about prosecutorial discretion? And they're like, hey, we can't admin close because of Castro Tom. We just yeah. can't do it. And in fact, it's taken until May to get any real guidance to right. them. Because there was a day one executive order changing enforcement priorities, you know, quote but unquote. But not affecting the department in their immigration court proceedings. Right. Yeah. And so the ICE attorneys have been telling us this whole time, we're waiting for guidance. We're waiting for guidance. And we finally got guidance. Now, there's a long background to say that some of these things are kind of weird to me. I don't know if you've had this experience yet, but I, since administrative closure is off the table, at least here in the ninth still, they seem more willing to dismiss cases, which for some people would just take them completely out of the system and they could lose any possible application for benefits. They could lose their work permit. And it's not necessarily ideal. Yeah. And so it does present itself with a real dilemma, right? So let's say you have an individual who either has a pending asylum application that they got a work permit through or a, what they call a cancellation of removal or some other type of relief in court that they have a work permit through. If the case is dismissed, they lose that work permit. And they just go back to being undocumented. Undocumented. And now they're not facing removal anymore but still, now their status is up in the air. And, and sometimes, you know, that can be really disconcerting for a lot of people because even if they had a so-called bad case, they still had a shot in their mind and they had a work permit. So now things like asylum, you could go and refile at the asylum unit and then they could have their case heard that way. There are a lot of issues. And then, you know, I'm not sure how the work permit thing would work. You know, we have to wait a year now for work permits. And so that's something that goes into play and how that would all work out. Unless you sign them up for ASAP. Right. And the whole thing. But still, they have to wait 180 days, right? Right. Right. You still have to 
You know, does the time that they were in court, does that count? Who knows? So there are a lot of considerations, but you're telling your client, like, you're going to be without a work permit at least for a while. And right. A lot of these people, they rely on that work permit to work. They have driver's licenses attached to that work permit. People who have cancellation cases, then all of a sudden they'll have nothing. And, right. you know. I was also thinking about this in the case of termination or dismissal, for example, for somebody who could consular process. Now, this gets like super weedy, but basically somebody who might qualify to get their papers abroad with a spouse petition, for example, but they can't because of the Trump enforcement priorities and prosecutorial discretion or lack thereof. Now, if their case is dismissed, they could apply for their waiver, then they could consular process. But consular processing now is taking five or six years. So you're telling people, we can get you out of court. You'll go back to being undocumented. You won't have a work permit. You won't have you know, a legal way to work or get a driver's license. And stuff. But in five years, four years or whatever, you'll have an appointment at the consulate and you'll be able to go and get your green card. And like, hopefully you're confused as a listener because it is confusing and it's convoluted and like none of it makes any sense. And it just doesn't, it, I think the memo that was released, I think they're being very careful because I think with the memo that they dropped day one, they got sued over it and the hundred day deportation ban ended up, being stayed by a judge. And I think they're kind of assuming that there's going to be some other type of litigation around this memo. So when you read the memo, it's very carefully worded. But I just don't, I just don't think like dismissal of proceedings is actually all that practical. In some cases, it might be perfectly fine. Right. But it doesn't solve anything. If well, What's the backlog now in immigration case? A million? Oh, yeah, it's over a million. Sure. Well, they say 1.3 million cases. I'm reading from the memo. Let's just say they dismissed a million of those. A million. Mm -hmm. That's huge, right? And then all of a sudden you have 300,000 cases, which is probably across the United States is probably manageable, right? But what happened to those 1 million people, right? right? Most of them are going to be there to be put back into proceedings at some point in time doesn't solve any issues right. for them. We, now, yeah. they could have said, you know, be a lot more aggressive in agreeing to grant cases that you can agree to. Right. Yeah. I don't think they said that. No. No, they could have inferred it. And I guess that might be the part where there we'd be worried about litigation. Right. Now, I will say this memo didn't come out that long ago, but in my limited experience since that time, I've had a couple of decent experiences with a trial attorney who's already has a good reputation in that regard. But like you said, during the last four years would tell me to you know, kick bricks, who's now saying, well, I can stipulate to this or I can help you out in this way or that way. And so I do think it's good overall. And we should probably take a step back and just question the system as a whole that makes it so that people can get benefits by being in removal proceedings not by not being in removal proceedings. And the fact that so many people are trying to walk this delicate line of, well, I kind of need to be in removal proceedings so I can have my work permit and have a shot at a green card. And uh, <laughs> why is that the system, right? That doesn't really make any sense. So, but that, that's the reality. Yeah, I mean, there is, as always there, and we've talked about it maybe too much, about to move to independent immigration courts, whatever you want that to mean. But really, so much of this should be taken outside of any type of court structure, right? And and again, another caveat, I mean, I'm for open borders and abolishing borders and all that. I'm just trying to work within the frame, somewhat within the framework that we have and realistically have for some time being. But if you take the people coming in to the border to claim asylum, you know, they'll go through if they have a credible fear interview that will take one, two, three, four hours. Sometimes they take even longer than that. And the ridiculous part is the only thing that officer can do is deny the claim and enter expedited order removal or send that person to an immigration judge where they've just heard the whole thing, right? Where they can sit through seven years of continued hearings and then tell the same story again 
to and another, you have to match it up perfectly to, to, to another guy. Yeah. So it just seems to me like that's like one of the easiest things just to give that asylum officer just the authority to grant asylum. Right. And if he doesn't want to, then he if he doesn't think there's enough, right, and he can refer to the immigration judge there. But I mean, now that's not going to solve a huge part of the problem, but it's going to solve some of it. Right. And cancellation of removal is another one of those cases where somebody comes to you, they've been here 10 years, they're a person of good moral character, quotation marks. They've got a spouse, parent, or child with legal status who would suffer irreparable harm, extreme and exceptionally unusual hardship, or exceptional and extremely unusual hardship. I always get that backwards. If they were deported, that's a perfect cancellation case. That's what you need to show. But because they're not in removal proceedings, there's nothing they can do. There's no way to apply. And that's another thing that I've always thought if there was, again, we should just give low key, but, or high key. <laughs> uh, if you just had a way to apply for something like cancellation on an affirmative basis, here's my evidence, send me a decision. You know, that would fix a lot yeah. of the problems. Yeah, and it's not like, I mean, they do that with waivers, right? With what they call a I-601 waiver, I-601A waiver, where it's a little bit of a lower burden because you only have to show extreme hardship, but it's still the same concept. And they do those cases all the time on paper. Yeah, in a year or less, right? Yeah. And if you want to set up an interview process, then that's fine. You know, maybe you hire more USCIS officers, but move away from the court structure. And if you need a deportation court, then why not save them for people that, I don't know, other things, right? You know, people who are maybe removable due to uh, criminal acts or, or things like that, right. you know, and, and really kind of focus that court system and then maybe having an independent court system makes sense. But, but this, so well, let's talk a little bit specifically about the memo. You know, they offer some guidance here, but it seems a little kind of wishy-washy and it seems like there's a lot of room for movement. And so the guidance was issued on May 27th and well, it wasn't released. Right. <laughs> it was leaked by our friend and not a friend of the show because not you know, a friend of the show. Enemy not, of the show. He should come on the show. First he was playing cool, like, oh yeah, I can't come on. And then the last three or four times I've asked him, he just hasn't responded. I think he has a restraining order at this point. But that's okay. Should we say who it is or are we not going to give him that credit? Yeah, no, don't don't give him credit. No, give him credit. He's a great guy. Yeah, and I, I wish I knew his name off the top of my head. So <laughs> Okay, we're just gonna not give him credit. Oh my god, what's his name? I'm blanking on you. Hamed Aliaziz. And so he writes for BuzzFeed. You can find him on Twitter and you should follow him. I mean, he's certainly one of the best immigration reporters out there. I, I think that's not a hot take at all. Um, right. He's great. So he, I mean, I, I think people have joked like he must be in like the email chains of DHS and, and all these agencies. There somewhere. <laughs> but it is weird that it wasn't released. But yes, it was like a week later, I think, that he was able to leak it. And even within the memo, <laughs> they reference, they say on May 27, 2021, the same day the memo was issued. Acting General Counsel Joseph Mayer issued a memorandum titled Implementing Interim Civil Immigration Enforcement Policies and Priorities. No one has seen that memo. Right. It's weird. Like, what is going on and why? Why is it? And I guess they were having meetings about it and all that. But what is the issue about releasing these memos? Right. It's weird. And, and I will say, going back to the administrative closure thing, Merrick Garland in Five minutes could rescind Castro Tum and say administrative closure is a thing and it's going to be one of our tools. We're basically going to just do what we did four years ago. And he has a ton of cover, too, because so many federal circuit courts have overruled it. You can just say, hey, you know, it's clear where this is going. Right. And so we're just going to. But I can almost guarantee like they'll still oh, the Sixth Circuit agreed with Castro Tum. Yeah. The Third Circuit, the Seventh, and a decision written by Justice Coney Barrett, by the way, rejected Castro Tum in the Seventh Circuit. 
Fourth Circuit, I think, was the first one to knock it down. Yeah, so uh, it's not a unique hot take. I think Ira Kurzban said this on Twitter that this memo with inaction on the part of the attorney general, not just on Castro Tom, but on matter of AB, matter of LEA, all these other decisions from the Trump administration. It's really kind of a toothless thing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And in this case, I've been negotiating with ICE recently. It's good to be negotiating again. But the trial attorney suggested several times throughout our conversations, would dismissal help this lady? And again, she's had a work permit seven years. Her three kids are permanent residents. The government's offering her to just go back to being undocumented. And she's got a good case for Mm -hmm. relief. And so that's my concern is like they'll use it to maybe dismiss a bunch of cases. One here, there's a section called long-term lawful permanent residents. So it says a favorable exercise of prosecutorial discretion should also be considered for LPRs, long-term permanent residents. Lawful permanent residents who are residing in the United States for many years, particularly when they acquired the LPR status at a young age, have demonstrated close family and community ties, dismissal of such cases that do not present serious aggravating factors, or allow the non citizen to maintain lawful immigration status and conserve infinite government resources. Now, problem is so I have a case coming up, a guy who's been a permanent resident, I think, since he was like a teenager. He got in a little trouble in his like mid 20s. And that was over 30 years ago. And it makes him removable from the United States. We're applying for something called 212C, which would allow him to maintain his status. Now, it's an easy case. Even, I mean, we joke about us, we about us being crappy attorneys, but yeah, even us, even we could handle this one. Right. His criminal conviction, I think, is from like 1991. He has a bunch of kids. He has a bunch of grandkids. He just retired, <laughs> you know, and so it's going to be an easy case. And I can imagine this is going to be one or be like, oh, why don't we just dismiss it? And it's like, no, why don't you just grant the relief? Because you can dismiss this. And then a couple of years from now, someone decides to put him back in the proceedings and he has to go through it all over again. Right. The thing is, if there's a lawful permanent resident who doesn't have relief, they probably have those aggravating factors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, too, because the psychology of all this, I'm really starting to think about this a lot. The trauma of being placed in removal proceedings, often with detention or arrest, being separated from your kids for some period of time. Now you've got to go to court. You've got courts looming. You've got the possibility of deportation on the horizon, maybe. That's a really stressful situation, toxic stress. And sometimes immigration brain, immigration lawyer brain is like, oh, that's great. We got a continuance for three years. That's amazing. You get to stay. Or, oh, it's great. They're going to dismiss your case. You can go back to the shadows. But for the person, a three-year continuance, I mean, obviously, if you have crappy relief, that might be a good thing. But it's also delaying this thing that you've just been dying about was stress. And I hear people all the time tell me, I cry randomly thinking about my case. The kids, and then the kids pick up on that. And so (laughs) the idea that the solution is to kick people back to the shadows or to do those sorts of things, it's not really all that helpful. And that's why, I mean, administrative closure, not ideal either, but you get to tell people like, Keep your work permit. As long as you stay straight with the law, you don't have to go back to court. Right. And I would tell my clients, hey, if you really want your case to be heard, we can always ask that to be put back on. Right. 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 And they have that power. It's going to be interesting to see how they how it works out. I mean, Merrick Arden has to get rid of Castro Tom. He has to get rid of like Matter of AB, LEA, all the other ones. And right now, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you're completely satisfied, you think he's doing a great job, one being that you think he sucks, what would you give Merrick Garland? I mean, as far as I know, he hasn't done anything, right? I guess there's some regulations that just dropped that we need to look at. I mean, it's got to be close to a one. Well, I mean, also, he's not pursuing, like, there's other things that he's still trying to defend the thought that 
presidents shouldn't be allowed to be sued right. for personal conduct. There's a lot of things that he's making that determination in, in the civil side. The criminal side, I think, is different. I think the politics should be off of the criminal side. Right. But the civil side really is a reflection of administrative policy. And he hasn't done, I think he's terrible. I agree with you. The idea that they can dismiss or they can do certain things, that's a mixed bag, as we've been really clear. The question is going to be, because during the Trump administration, you could have somebody, I had a case where a daughter was suicidal and cutting and had severe depression. And the trial attorney, the ICE attorney said, that's normal. Her father being deported won't matter. It won't affect her any differently than it would affect any other child. And that's been their posture for the last four years to just oppose everything, to be aggressive in cases that really make you want to question humanity. And the question is going to be if with this memo, we start to see a softening on these cases that have been litigated. You're at that final moment in the hearing. The judge asked it, the government's position, are they still going to be taking these outlandish positions, outlandish in my opinion? Or are we going to see a softening of that side? Like, I, and I don't know. So we'll see. That's an open yeah. question. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. We'll, we'll let you know. Yeah. All right. Nice talking to Stephen. And yeah. if any of our fellow immigration attorneys have thoughts, they can tweet us. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually really interested to hear people's experience. Yeah. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, Stephen, sorry about your team. 